This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Nine. John Brown, a poor carrier of Lanarkshire, was for his singular piety commonly called the Christian carrier. Many years later, when Scotland enjoyed rest, prosperity, and religious freedom, old men who remembered the evil days described him as one versed in divine things, blameless in life, and so peaceable that the tyrants could find no offence in him except that he absented himself from the public worship of the Episcopalians. On the first of May he was cutting turf when he was seized by Claverhouse's dragoons, rapidly examined, convicted of nonconformity, and sentenced to death. It is said that, even among the soldiers, it was not easy to find an executioner, for the wife of the poor man was present. She led one little child by the hand. It was easy to see that she was about to give birth to another, and even those wild and hard-hearted men, who nicknamed one another Beelzebub and Apollyon, shrank from the great wickedness of butchering her husband before her face. The prisoner, meanwhile, raised above himself by the near prospect of eternity, prayed loud and fervently, as one inspired, till Claverhouse, in a fury, shot him dead. It was reported by credible witnesses that the widow cried out in her agony, "'Well, sir, well, the day of reckoning will come,' and that the murderer replied, to man I can answer for what I have done, and as for God, I will take him into mine own hand. Yet it was rumoured that even on his seared conscience and adamantine heart, the dying ejaculations of his victim made an impression which was never effaced. On the 5th of May, two artisans, Peter Gillies and John Bryce, were tried in Ayrshire by a military tribunal consisting of fifteen soldiers. The indictment is still extant. The prisoners were charged, not with any act of rebellion, but with holding the same pernicious doctrines which had impelled others to rebel, and with wanting only opportunity to act upon these doctrines. The proceeding was summary. In a few hours the two culprits were convicted, hanged, and flung together into a hole under the gallows. The 11th of May was made remarkable by more than one great crime. Some rigid Calvinists had from the doctrine of reprobation drawn the consequence that to pray for any person who had been predestined to perdition was an act of mutiny against the eternal decrees of the Supreme Being. Three poor labouring men deeply imbued with this unamiable divinity, were stopped by an officer in the neighbourhood of Glasgow. They were asked whether they would pray for King James the Seventh. They refused to do so, except under the condition that he was one of the elect. A file of musketeers was drawn out. The prisoners knelt down. They were blindfolded, and within an hour after they had been arrested, their blood was lapped up by the dogs. While this was done in Clydesdale, an act not less horrible was perpetrated in Eskdale. One of the proscribed covenanters, overcome by sickness, had found shelter in the house of a respectable widow, and had died there. The corpse was discovered by the laird of Westerhall, a petty tyrant who had in the days of the covenant professed inordinate zeal for the Presbyterian Church, who had, since the Restoration, purchased the favour of the government by apostasy, and who felt towards the party which he had deserted 
the implacable hatred of an apostate. This man pulled down the house of the poor woman, carried away her furniture, and, leaving her and her younger children to wander in the fields, dragged her son Andrew, who was still a lad, before Claverhouse, who happened to be marching through that part of the country. Claverhouse was just then strangely lenient. Some thought that he had not been quite himself since the death of the Christian carrier ten days before, but Westerhall was eager to signalise his loyalty and extorted a sullen consent. The guns were loaded, and the youth was told to pull his bonnet over his face. He refused, and stood confronting his murderers with the Bible in his hand. "'I can look you in the face,' he said. "'I have done nothing of which I need be ashamed. But how will you look in that day when you shall be judged by what is written in this book?' He fell dead, and was buried in the moor. On the same day two women, Margaret MacLachlan and Margaret Wilson, the former an aged widow, the latter a maiden of eighteen, suffered death for their religion in Wigtonshire. They were offered their lives if they would consent to abjure the cause of the insurgent covenanters, and to attend the episcopal worship. They refused, and they were sentenced to be drowned. They were carried to a spot which the Solway overflows twice a day, and were fastened to stakes fixed in the sand between high and low water mark. The elder sufferer was placed near to the advancing flood, in the hope that her last agonies might terrify the younger into submission. The sight was dreadful, but the courage of the survivor was sustained by an enthusiasm as lofty as any that is recorded in martyrology. She saw the sea draw nearer and nearer, but gave no sign of alarm. She prayed and sang verses of psalms till the waves choked her voice. After she had tasted the bitterness of death, she was, by a cruel mercy, unbound and restored to life. When she came to herself, pitying friends and neighbours implored her to yield. Dear Margaret, only say, God save the king. The poor girl, true to her stern theology, gasped out, May God save him, if it be God's will. Her friends crowded round the presiding officer. She has said it, indeed, sir, she has said it. Will she take the abjuration? he demanded. Never, she exclaimed. I am Christ's, let me go. And the waters closed over her. For the last time. End of part nine. Read by Gazina in Valletta, June two thousand and six.